3,353 veterans who live in Queen Anne's County, according to the last census. We're probably not going to interview 3,353 of <laughs> them, but we're getting as many as we can every Friday. And what we do, it's very relaxed. We have a conversation. We don't know where it's going to end up, but you're going to learn more about the individual than you know. And I'm delighted to have with me someone I've known since he was knee-high to a grasshopper. His sister, Joy, was my ch probably brought up my children as much as I did, or as a babysitter. Eric Johnson, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, sir. Beautiful fall day. Oh, my gosh, yes. And before we get in the interview, I do have to compliment you and your wife. The best front yard in the history of Queen Anne's County. <laughs> you drive, Eric, describe very briefly when I drive past Kennard, what do I see in my right yes, hand Yes, so side? on Little Kidwell Avenue, 502, everybody's welcome to come. Just ask that you don't be... Uh, Don't touch. At night. Oh, at night, okay. Uh, people are driving by and beeping <laughs> in the middle of the night, which we appreciate. It's kind of like the car applause. Yeah, it gets old at 2 or 3 in the but, morning. But uh, at any rate, we have, I think it's at last count, 13 life-size Halloween figures and then a 12-foot or 14-foot scarecrow. But who's the one oh, holding the uh, scathe? I, I think one, that would be Jason. Okay, uh, okay. Jason Voorhees. So we've got Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, Pennywise, you name it. And what's really cool about those figures is they will all be relocated. They're going to take a vacation from our front lawn to Centerville. Day. Oh, good. So we'll and then for the Halloween event that night. Everybody can see them soon. Everybody okay. well, will good. see them. You've done a nice job. Thank you. All right, let's go with the reason you're here. Eric, I know one thing. We, you and I were talking about chicken neckers and natives. <laughs> Who cares? We're all Americans. But born and raised where? So I was born in Silver Spring, Maryland at Holy Montgomery Cross County. Hospital, okay. Montgomery County. And then I spent most of my uh, elementary school years um, in Arnold, Maryland. We okay. lived right across from Anne Arundel Community College. Okay. And, um, but I have, if I can use this opportunity to correct the record, so um, and, and a lot of the work that I've done, if an article appears about that locally, Without doubt, I've lost count, but I've, it was at least 15 as of a couple of years ago articles that said Eric Johnson, an Eastern Shore native or a Centerville native. So you're officially going on record that I'm you and I are both chicken neckers. Yes, and I proud am of in it. fact a chicken necker. Okay. Not sure I'm proud of it. No, I'm kidding. I'm proud of it. But, uh, but, you catch but more I, crabs I consider there, myself yeah. an honorary uh, Centervillian. Good. Okay, and that great. I am proud of. Yes. So what age did you come over to Queen Anne's County? So I came when I was in fourth grade, okay. and so um, can't do public math these days, but I want to say that's... You're still young. You're 80, baby. It was in like the mid-80s, I okay. think, is when we got How here. much older is your sister Joy than you? Joy is two and a half years older oh, than Oh, so I. she started babysitting for McNeil's probably five years after you moved here. Yes, okay. that sounds so, which right. Which is good. So you went to Centerville Elementary? Went to Centerville Elementary. Centerville Middle. Centerville Middle. And... Queen Anne's High what School. Was you, any, what were your favorite things? Were you an athlete, an actor, um, or a troublemaker? So I was just one of those people that was involved in too much everything. Um, and I was one of those guys that didn't really fit into any particular okay. clique. I, did a lot I was of kind of friends with everybody. Good. And Good. at least that's what they say when I go to the high school reunions. I know you is, like comic books now. I know it, right? <sighs> yes. Went to Alley Cat Comics when I was a kid. And um, the favorite thing, though, about high school is I met and married my high school sweetheart. Okay, the current, so, oh, really? Uh, yep, Great. Jamie uh, uh, Carter at the time. Jamie um, was a Queen Anne's County high grad. I yes. didn't know that. Okay. So I uh, was a little bit of a stalker, apparently. Mm -hmm. I uh, was very Let's shy. Let's use a better word. You, you were <laughs> fond of her. Okay. I was very fond of her, and hey, because yeah. I was so shy, I would follow her around in high school. Really? And finally, she figured out that I liked her, and she, uh, she was an office aide. Okay. She came and got me out of my Spanish class. And I thought I was in trouble. And halfway to the office, she stopped and said, all right, I'm going to ask you something. <laughs> I was like, okay. And she said, I like you. I think you like me. So what's up? Oh, wow. And, and the you rest started dating me. Yes. Oh, very good. <laughs> now, did you, did you marry right out of high school? or what? No. no. So interestingly enough, we kind of went our separate ways um, college-wise. I went to Washington College. She went to Anne Arundel. Okay. And we split up for the time. And we both got engaged to other people. So you went... Totally and different direction. yet somehow those engagements fell apart. Not somehow. I think we were ins inspired and um, meant to be together. And, so and it worked out. And so came back together, married in 1999. Okay, well, let's go, back, let's, let's go back a little further. You graduate from high school, okay, involved in a little bit of everything. Yes. And what was your major at Washington College? So at Washington College, I did a major uh, in uh, psychology, a minor okay. in sociology. Okay. 
So graduated in 99, and one of my, this was probably one of the most crystallizing experiences for me in terms of public service. So I was student body president there for two years. At Washington was, College. At Washington College. Okay. It was in my last year, and George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush showed up for a speech, and I had to speak. And it was one of those events where I literally prayed, God, give me the ability to say something that doesn't make me look terrible. <laughs> and get the foot you know, out of the mouth, Don't right? pick my nose or something stupid <laughs> on camera, And because um, ESPN was there. Oh, and, wow. um, it's uh, a big not, event. Yeah, it was, it was crazy stuff. But uh, lo and behold, he was impressed with something I said at the end okay. of my speech. I quoted George Washington, who said in a letter to Washington College when he served on the board, I... Um, may the great author of the universe smile upon this institution and make it a blessing to this country. And I, and I asked folks to please consider a life of service just as George H.W. Bush did. So he gets up and he says, I want to thank the college for inviting me and I want to thank Eric Johnson. For the quote. Why shoot low? What's wrong with 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? Good. Because I had joked in my speech that I wanted to come back as chairman of the board of the college someday. Well, we ended up becoming pen pals and so then I Got invited You're writing to President of the United States. A, exactly. Not so I got bad, invited to apply to uh, his School of Government Public Service okay. at A&M, okay. uh, Texas A&M. This is Texas A&M. So I went there right after. That's College Station? College Station, college Texas, Station. yep. Went there for two years where I earned two master's degrees, one in public service and one in public administration. Okay. So you Washington College, right to grad school? Right to grad school. With a wedding in there in between? Yep. Right, okay. Right you and the missus? Chicken necker. <laughs> yes. Went to, how long, how long did you actually live in College Station? We were there for exactly two years and then uh, moved back to Maryland. And okay. um, I won't say which agency for obvious reasons, but I was hired by a state level agency and I. 7 Eleven? <laughs> <laughs> Check it, Eric. State okay. government. And okay. they, um, I, I saw some things that were very unethical going on, and okay. I literally was taught from a very young age, you don't quit a job until you have another one lined up, but this was the exception. And so um, from there, I started doing some grant writing work with okay. Linda Walls, who right. everybody knows, um, lives in Chestertown these days, and I think as of current count, she's raised over a billion dollars in mm -hmm. grants, but I learned from the best. And um, knowing George Bush, going to Texas A&M and really studying public service what I learned was public service isn't necessarily being an elected official, but it's a state of mind. Sure. Helping people. So we go to Texas A&M. We come back here. We had a job experience you weren't in love with, right? Yes. But you knew you wanted to do public service. Yes. So what was the next step? So no the next step or? was um, a nonprofit had just started in Kent County called okay. Chesapeake Fields Institute. Mm -hmm. And the whole premise was to uh, use uh, innovation to generate profitability for area farmers. And um, I didn't know anything about agriculture, even though I grew up here on the shore, um, but I was good at fundraising. And so I helped them raise about a million dollars, I think it was, and then 9-11 hit. Okay, so 9-11 hits, changes not only the whole country's lives, but obviously had some effect on you. Absolutely. And that effect was that military That effect was, um, my, my younger brother Greg had been in the Air Force for a number of years, and I called him up and I said, I feel inspired to serve. Mm -hmm. And I said, what are your thoughts? So he helped me kind of shape my path, and I found a recruiter, and uh, my recruiter store, everybody's got one, is, um, I said, how does this work? Do I give you my resume and then you <laughs> You give me, me your life is what yeah, you do. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So I thought he was going to come back and say, well, I looked at your resume, your job history, mm -hmm. and here are the things that you could potentially do. He comes back with hospital administration. And I thought, okay, wow. well, I haven't done that. Right. So I said, okay, well, if that's the match. Well, then I found out later that's what he was recruiting for. So. Oh, so he was going to find a way to make all me recruit, fit in that box. All recruiters. They exactly. did it to me in 1966 and everyone we even, okay, so <laughs> we go to the recruiter. You went Air Force, you were smart. You didn't go Army like <laughs> I did. Okay, you went Air Force. So how did, how did the career start out? Were basic training OCS? Yeah, so um, I did what was, uh, I was a direct accession as an officer, so I went to commissioned officer training, which my brother, who was enlisted, richly razzed me over because he said, you realize the training you went to spells cot, as in something <laughs> you lay on But he had rest. to salute you for the rest and of the And I said, yeah, I appreciate that. But uh, it was about a three-month training <laughs> at Maxwell Air Force Base in okay. uh, Alabama. Oh, so you went to the, basically right to an OCS type program. Correct. Okay. Oh, and wow. uh, from there, we went to to hospital administration well, go, Let's stay there. Oh, sorry. Well, everyone has horror stories. I had a Marine. I've had the <laughs> Navy. Tell me about, uh, I call it OCS, whatever you call it. What was that like? So 
on the same campus, we had COT commissioner officer training, all okay. the directed sessions who were now, already... these are college graduates probably, Basically. Okay. So it was the surgeons, the okay. chaplains, the okay. lawyers, okay. the hospital these administrators. These are the specialty people, real specialty. Correct. Okay. So we were already, we already had signed our commissions. Bot so you're was all there. second lieutenants, yes? Well, no. Oh. So the way it works is in order to, for, to address pay equity, if you were a neurosurgeon, you came in as a lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant so we colonel. had these folks that had no experience. Eric, that's a lot of money, lieutenant yes. colonel. And you assume when you meet a lieutenant colonel that they're going to have this wealth of experience. Yes. No. Yeah. So that's what gets those career fields into some trouble when they start out. But on the same campus, we had BOT, basic officer training. Okay, and that's what you were. So those, no, I was in COT. Oh, you were in COT. But the BOT you were a folks, lieutenant colonel for a while? I was no. I started okay. out as a first lieutenant. All right, okay. And, um, but the BOT folks were not officers yet. Okay. So it was almost like Naval Academy e folks. Oh, okay. They were, they were just candidates. Officers candidates. in training, yes. Okay. Candidates. So I looked very young, apparently, for my age. So mm -hmm. everywhere I went, somebody who was an enlisted leader would say, why are you in the BX, PX? Um, you know you're not supposed to be shopping. And I was like, um, yes, I am allowed to shop. Yeah. And they'd be like, what's your name and rank? And I said, First Lieutenant Eric Johnson. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Show an ID card, yeah, okay. <laughs> but it happened almost every day. So what was, but go back to, what was the actual, I mean, I have, Walter Pauls was on the show, uh, was, was an officer candidate school in the Army. Yes. He tells a great story about one day, uh, either the DI or the OIC, ever what, came in and said, I want everybody to move their foot lockers from the second floor out the front door, then get your wall lockers, move them from the second floor to the first floor. Well, Walter, a very smart man, college graduate, like you at that point, <laughs> said, okay. But then the lieutenant said, I want you to move the footlockers back to the second floor. And Walter, uh, I, I want to steal Walter's story, but in this show, it changed his life. Yes. So did you have uh, horror stories in the Canada? Um, I guess I should say I really was very fortunate that I had no real horror stories. But okay. what was uncomfortable... You were in the Air Force here. Come on, this is a country club. What here. was uncomfortable was I had enlisted siblings who and other friends who said, you know, Go in there and have the attitude that you're there to be trained and you're there to be reshaped, cooperate, redefined. Cooperate, right? But there was a good a number of folks who thought, well, I have spent all this time in medical school or in law school and I shouldn't be yelled at or I okay. shouldn't have. And so well, we they had were a, professionals and they were, yeah. yeah they, but we had some uncomfortable moments where the officer training school leadership, a, a colonel, by the way, who later became a general, uh, wonderful lady. Just, I had so much respect for her. So, a woman, oh, I see. A woman, she, OIC. she dressed us all down real quick and and invited people to get up and leave. Yeah. And uh, I just knew somebody because would of be, your behavior. You mean uh, they, they're just the resistance okay. to the okay. order and discipline. And okay. uh, but she got us, she got us snapped together real quick. And it worked and, out. Uh, yeah. So, so it wasn't a nightmare. It was for the other people who didn't want to toe the line. But. Um, but I enjoyed that. I, I loved, I was a one of seven kids when I grew up on Chesterfield Avenue in Centerville. And, so you liked um, the structure. There was a lot of chaos in the family, yeah. having a family that big. And okay. so I did. I liked the discipline and the trust and the integrity. Well, already being commissioned, I mean, uh, OCS for the Army guys, they all they became E5s. Okay, and they got, that was their pay scale. Yeah. So you were getting lieutenant's pay. Yes. Now, did they make you do the, the nonsense of wall lockers up and down? Or that we had to PG do a little training? bit of that, admittedly, okay. but not quite as much as okay. if I had gone to You were traded camp. as office, as officers. We were. Okay. We were, in fact. So it was a All good right, experience. you graduate, okay, eight weeks, how many weeks did you say? Um, my memory's telling me yeah, we were there for, time. Four, for three, eight months. Weeks, some, three months. Um, okay. But then we went to uh, Health Service administra Administration okay, so you, you, School. You got a commission. You get some basic officer training, how officers would behave, et cetera, yes. et cetera. Then you go to a specialized like a tech school. school, yes. Okay. And, and so that was uh, Health Service Administration School. That now, was, where was this now? That was in Wichita Falls at um, Shepherd Air Force Base, okay. Texas. What was that like? That was amazing. Okay, I had okay. never been to Texas, and I figured out very quickly that Texas is not a state. And <laughs> state you, of it mind. It is a country. It is <laughs> a country. It is a, it's a thing. Right. And... Um, and I thought that was great, like the pride and, and just how people in Texas feel about their mm -hmm, state. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. And, um, and I enjoyed the travel, um, you know, growing up in Maryland. I didn't really go outside the state very often. Yeah, we went to New Jersey. To you were an Eastern Shoreman, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I got to travel and made some good friends there. And then, if you recall, I didn't understand why I got picked for hospital administration 
once I started Besides the course, recruiter. It, yeah. <laughs> once I started taking the classes, I fell in love with okay. it. Okay. And so I really enjoyed. So it. how? What? Are, give us some. You have classes all day yep. on how, on administrative functions, Correct. what to do, et cetera, et cetera. So we did like medical logistics, um, health plan management, because okay. military folks, as you know, we get Tricare as our mm -hmm. health plan, and so understanding how that works, how to administer it, how to look at the processes involved for people to access so care. So it's basically classwork for six class hours or work, seven hours. Correct. Day. Graduate um, school part two. And very two. intense. I mean, we, this was not sit and watch PowerPoints. It was have the instructor go through PowerPoints, but we had tons of manuals to read. You had to do And things. then testing. Okay. And if you didn't pass, you had to, you, you weren't going to continue. Wash your back for no, okay. Correct. Now, while you were going to school, did you have uh, Air Force officer duties, like were you officer of the day ever? Or? I was. Um, okay. We had uh, a number of duties. Um, we had opportunities to be in certain clubs, and so they kept us very, very busy. Okay. I, we had Bill Moore, who you know, who was in the Air Force in Thailand, and he tells that one of us Army guys and Marines cry. Bill was in a secret war in Thailand, had a nine to five job. At five o'clock, he'd wear civilian clothes, swimming pool, movies, go into the village. Us <laughs> Army guys didn't wear civilian clothes. So in the Air Force, lifestyle good, food, housing, etc. Very much so. And and what's so funny is, you know, I, I've accepted the nicknames of Chair Force. Mm -hmm. You know, have a seat, Air Force, let the Army do it. Well, the Army, remember, this is all part <laughs> of the ribbing of vet Only veterans are allowed to exactly. do it. Exactly. Yeah. But, and I know we'll talk about this in a second, fast forward to my deployment, several Army guys that I was uh, stationed with in uh, uh, Afghanistan, they would, you know, tease me, and uh, I would, my core for my mm -hmm. career field was the Medical Service Corps, right. MSC, and so they would call us, make some coffee. <laughs> and, uh, but privately, these folks would pull me aside and say, how do I cross over to the blue? Oh, yeah, so it's, a they, better, it's a better lifestyle. Yeah, and they do. The Air Force just has, for whatever reason, been able to budget into housing and other amenities that they really They treat you does, like a human being. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, so. I, Eric, one of my best experiences ever I was a volunteer chaplain at Dover Air Base. Now, in the Army, you go through officer enlisted with a tray, and they slop food in your plate. Yes. I go to Dover Air Force Base. It's like a mall food court. There's yes. a McDonald's. There's a Pizza yes. Hut. And That's you great. guys, uh, Air Force treated people better. They respected people better. Yes. And your living conditions were better, I'm assuming. They, they really were. We, um, toward the end of my uh, ten years of, or nine years of service, I... Um, was able to get single family home, not a duplex oh, or a quad. Made. And, and you're married there, you're a married yeah. guy. And okay. so we, we, we had wonderful housing Good. and I, I wouldn't Good. trade it for anything. Eric, so okay, you go to this advanced training in the medical field, medical management, where from there? So on that note, I uh, didn't go into military service to travel, but I just assumed that would be part of it sure. and that I get to go to some cool places. All around the world. Brother Greg enlisted, he was at Aviano um, Air Base, Italy, no, that was my brother Kirk. But Greg was at Lake and Heath, uh, England. Uh, he they traveled. They yeah, traveled. They just they got to go to all these cool places. So you got, I was waiting for my assignment, okay. and I got Andrews Air Force Base <laughs> right in our backyard, an hour from your house. Yes, and that was a stressful assignment because it's presidential airlift wing. Okay, a lot of politics. Well, let's slow down. Let's go back. You leave yes, Texas. Back. You got advanced training. You're assigned right to Andrews. Correct. Okay, so continue with so what were you there, doing there? I was, yeah. and this was really scary. Um, they not only told us while we were graduating the COT, or excuse me, the uh, Health Service Administration School, but they also told us what our titles were going to be. And I was told I was going to be the Chief of Managed Care at Malcolm Grove Medical Center at Andrews Air Force. Okay, Bay. so you're, you're a young and I'm second like, lieutenant. I just graduated, <laughs> and I'm going to be in charge. chief of something. Okay. So, um, but I thought, you know what? I got to prove myself, and so I had some really good mentors that said immediately get to know your enlisted mm -hmm. and trust them. The implicitly. sergeants are going to run the, run the show. And in. that's exactly yeah. what happened. I said, I'm going to look out for you and I'm going to give you all, all the credit. And if we fail, I'm going to take sure. responsibility. Good leader. And so, that helped. So what were you doing and how long? So I was responsible for our call center. Um, I was responsible no, call for, centers, people so for appointments. Okay. And, um, and what was complicated about that was in the National hey, Capital Give us the years. This is 2000. So this was, so I entered active duty in 2003. So Just I want to say close. 2004 okay. ish. Okay. So 20 years ago. Exactly. So um, we immediately made friends with the uh, Bethesda National Naval Hospital, okay. Chief of Managed Care, mm -hmm. Walter Reed, and then Fort Belvoir, the smaller campuses of medical. 
we started a, an access to care task force. Which is? And which um, was? basically getting all these people together to say, how do we improve access? Because what was happening was people would not be able to get an appointment, say, at Walter Reed, a soldier in, at the Army. They're too busy. And you know, maybe they just, they, their appointments were all booked up. Okay. And they really needed to get in. So they would call our appointment line, and based on rules that we should have been following, if you were active duty and you wanted an appointment, you came first. Okay. So we weren't playing that well in the sandbox. So uh, we formed the task force to say we need to have basically virtually one call center. You call a number, and whoever answers the phone is going to book you, you for place. the next available appointment okay. at any of those places. So I didn't realize how critically important that was and impactful. And the young lady and I that co-chaired it got medals just for doing that. Are they give you bronze and stars or what are they getting? We, we didn't quite get bronze stars. We got um, joint service achievement medals. A nice but way, a nice really, career boost. Yes, and it really blew away my commanders at Malcolm Grove because they said, you've been on active duty for six months. Well, I've been on active duty for close to a year, but as far as in my assignment, for six months and was already getting a decoration. And so yeah, I was very honored, very humbled by that. Yeah. But it also reinforced for me the idea that here I am in charge of managed care, so I know about access. And there were many times in my career that I had trouble getting an appointment. So it always made me think, if I'm the Marine Corps grunt or the aircraft mechanic, and I have no knowledge of medical. You're frustrated. What does that look like? I don't know what like? to do. Oh, like so, many of us go through getting a VA appointment, right? Exactly. You make the sign of the cross before we call. So I think in those moments, it really crystallized for me the idea that whether I'm in charge of this type of thing or I'm a veteran, I'm going to want to help veterans good, with access good. to care. That's good. How, now, how long were you at Andrews? So I was at Andrews for uh, only two years. Famous story is um, our commander at the hospital, a one-star general, every day would send emails out about jobs and other commands. Okay. And I but didn't read many of them because I just started. Well, sure. one of them said job opportunity for a medical service car officer, myself, and um, to be the executive officer to a general in Illinois at Scott Air Force Base. Okay. Well, I wrote my commander and I said, hey, this sounds exciting. I'd like to know more. Yeah. Not because I thought I was eligible, and because I didn't think I was eligible. I thought I probably need, it said, I think, a So many years experience. With experience. Are you still a second were you I was first a first lieutenant, lieutenant first getting ready to pin on captain. Okay. And um, I just wanted to understand if at some point I want to do this, is it appropriate for a career field path? Yeah. Well, the commander didn't read my whole message. He, he saw, I'm interested, <laughs> he was sent gone. it to the general, and before I know it, I'm getting an interview. And I just <laughs> knew I wasn't going to be picked once he figured out, oh, you just pinned on captain. Mm -mm. I got picked. Okay. Now, we, okay, so we go Andrews. Now, where is this again? Scott Air Force Base. Which is? Uh, so that is um, in uh, close to Belleville, Illinois. Okay, so you, go to the, you went from the East Coast to Midwest. Correct. So I go from Andrews, mm -hmm. very political, very very high number of Around general the country, officers, all of a sudden. to the Pentagon of the Midwest, as <laughs> it was known. Because <laughs> okay. uh, Scott Air Force Base was the transportation hub. Okay. So we had all of the major commands under each branch of service for, so I think it was the Surface Deployment and Distribution Center for the Navy, um, I forget what Army's Transportation Command was, but for Air Force, it was Air you Mobility had Command. You had everybody there. And then the DOD level command, Transportation Command. Okay. We had 30-some general officers okay. on this base. So what were you doing there now? So there what? I was the executive officer so you ran to the, the command show. surgeon. You ran the show. And, um, and I, it was a brutal assignment. Um, the so guy what is I an executive for, officer to the command surgeon? Oh, my surgeon? gosh. What, I what had don't to do, they do? I did everything. His laundry. <laughs> I, I, I mean, seriously, his dry cleaning. What rank was he? Uh, he was a one star, oh, and okay. I helped write his package well, you know, for two you're, stars. You're fooling around with a general, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was so. I, it was a death by fire, and uh, I learned a lot. I had to write all of his uh, direct reports, who were all colonels, their officer performance reports. Okay. I never supervised an officer, so I'd never written one. So all of a sudden, you're doing the reports. Oh my gosh, it was intense. Well, but, welcome to the Air Force, right? Exactly. Young that's what it was. And yeah. uh, how it was long brutal. were you there? So I did that for. Uh, close to two years. Okay, so two years at Andrews, two years the Midwest. What happens next? Well, before leaving the Midwest, I got an assignment at the medical center at oh, Scott Air Force Base. Okay. So I started out as a group practice manager, not unlike the chief of managed care role. I had to um, create templates for appointments for providers at different clinics, manage access to care, um, very similar to my assignment at Andrews. And then um, the most coveted job at the flight level is 
resource management, which is basically being the CFO. Okay, chief financial You get financial that job, officer. you can do anything further okay. on in so your you're watching field. the money flow wherever it goes. Correct. So I got picked to do that, and they typically put a lieutenant colonel in that spot. And you got it as a captain. I got it as a captain. So I had a really good mentor at the time that uh, preceded me in that mm -hmm. role. And again, at that time, I learned the valuable lesson of trust your senior NCO and trust your civilian GS employees. Sure. And they so, let them do all the work. And I, so I did that for two years. And then from there, I was deployed. Okay, so we go Andrews, we go uh, Midwest. And then how did the, did they just tell you to go overseas? How did the overseas So deployment? it started, and I, I almost missed an assignment. So after GPM, uh, group practice manager and resource management officer, I got pulled over by the wing commander, the installation commander, to be in what we called XP, plans, programs, and readiness. Okay. So there I got tasked with writing the uh, pandemic flu plan for the Air Force, um, an interoperability communication plan for the Air Force. and. So I learned a lot about plans and um, war plans and wrote probably six or seven. And um, so because I learned how to do that, I then get a tasking to be deployed to Regional Command East, Bagram Airfield, Afghanistan. And I was supposed to go and do nine line communications. So as you know, if you're captured or injured, you call up a nine line, nine lines of information. And I was basically going to be a 911 operator oh, okay. in the desert and deploy resources in response to the so nine lines. So now you're married? I'm Any married at that, at that time. Point? At that time, I had my our two sons who okay. were under the age of 12. And we had just had our daughter, who was only a couple months old. And you got to tell your wife, yeah. I'm going to Afghanistan. I'm gone, and it's going to be um, six months to a year. Hmm. Welcome to the Air Force. Now, Eric, we've got only two minutes. We're going to have to rush yeah. this up. We, we'll do another show yeah, later. Yeah, sure. You go to Afghanistan. The war's on. Yes. This is a combat situation. Yes. So what the heck were you doing in Afghanistan? So in Afghanistan, I show up, and they're like, you're not going to be a nine-line dispatcher. We want okay. you to be senior war planner for NATO. Senior, senior medical war, war planner for, for NATO. All of NATO. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that Which was just, what? oh, gosh. I had to plan medical support for all the election sites for the um, uh, Wolosi Jirga, I think is what it was called, but that was the, the Afghanistan mm -hmm. parliamentary election sites because um, they were all terrorist targets. And, um, and I'll never forget, I have to share this. So I got through that assignment, learned a lot. Three days before I came home, I had a JAG officer say, I need you to do an investigation of an escalation of force. And I thought, why are you going to ask what me to do this three days yeah, before I got yeah, home? So I did it. And during that time, I was at a forward operating base um, called Camp Black Horse, and it was a very Taliban-friendly country. It had been a Taliban base that we had captured, and I got dropped off right outside the wire to be picked up by a helicopter of opportunity. And I see the village in the distance, and these villagers come up to me, and they're going through my pockets, and I spoke enough Dari based on our language training to know they were talking about how much I was worth. And I literally, Fred, prayed. I was like, God, you got to get me out of you this situation. You thought you were going to be taking this appeal to Help me get home. And they never touched my weapon. People have asked me, why didn't you draw your weapon and shoot them? And I said, because escalation of force, mm -hmm. status of force. I tried to keep it down. Yeah, I couldn't do that. But thank God a helicopter appeared. They scattered. General says, you need a ride, son? And I said, hell yes. You get me out of here. So I didn't tell anybody about that for three months. Because I knew if I told anybody while I was in the desert, I wouldn't go home. They're going to keep you there for an yeah, investigation. Yeah, the investigation. So, but that taught me that, oh my gosh, that's trauma. Oh, and yeah. And so I got help right away. I helped start a support group for that. And Good. then that got me on a path of oh, the how we help veterans. other veterans. Team. Eric, what we'll do, we'll have to stop now. Because yes. what happened, George is going to get mad at me. Yes. <laughs> but what we'll do, like we did with Bob and the others, we'll do a part two in the future, yeah. okay? Thank you for your service. Thank you, Fred. Thank you for your good stories. And thank you for bringing your wife with us to keep an eye on both of us. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm Fred McNeil. Thank you for watching QAC TV7. You've been watching a great show it's called Thank You for Your Service. We've had Eric Johnson did a great job. We'll have him back to finish his stories. My time's up. Thank you for your time. We're going to see you next time. And all the veterans out there, thank you for serving.